Hello, all. Uh, see, my studio is here and other folks are showing up. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming to the first of five um, individually uh, curated uh, speakers for uh, the Wallingberg Studio 2021. Um, this uh, uh, speaker that we have today will is uh, invited by myself for our uh, Resisting Erasure uh, studio. And um, she has a unique perspective on the concept of resisting erasure, uh, not only as a researcher, but as, a, as a, an in-person, as part of her personal history as well. And I couldn't think of a better person to come and speak to us about this concept about how it operates personally in her work, in her research, and in her teaching. So um, I would like to introduce to you our today's speaker, uh, um, Mina Aga, uh, who is an architect and a researcher and was recently a 2019-2020 Spatial Justice Fellow and visiting assistant professor at the University of Oregon. Currently, she is coordinating a spatial justice agenda at the Flemish Architectural Institute in Belgium. She holds a PhD from the University of Antwerp and a MA from uh, Cologne International School of Design. Dr. Aga is a third generation displaced Egyptian Nubian, a legacy that infuses her research interest in race, gender, space, and territory. Among her publications are, and I quote, Nubia Still Exists, The Utility of Nostalgic Space, uh, The Non-Work of the Unimportant, The Shadow Economy of Nubian Women in Displaced Villages, and Liminal Public's Marginal Resistance. Um, her work can be found at, at uh, Project Unsettled, uh, all lowercase, dot com. So uh, without further ado, I would appreciate if you would help me welcome uh, Professor Aga, and we will hear uh, her <laughs> wise words to us today. So thank you, Mina, for showing. Hi, hello, everyone. So I am very excited to be invited to this uh, uh, to the studio when Craig told me if I work and my work has to do with resistance and I said of course then we can have a theoretical debate on resistance and then um, he sent me the site and I just went into a long uh, trip in through the history of Africa town and I was so enamored in how this is a quintessentially African story and how it relates to the story of my grandmothers and grand and grandfathers who got displaced by the Egyptian government all through the, the 20th century. So I decided that I'm going to, I'm not going to give you a theoretical uh, um, lecture. I'm going to just bombard you with stories and see what happens. And I think I got overly zealous with all my stories and I buy so much into this lecture. So if it looks fragmented, let it, uh, it's okay. It's okay that it's, uh, it's the stories get fragmented and complex and uh, un, uh, uncontainable because this is what stories do to us. <laughs> uh, let me share my screen if you don't mind. Um, you should be able to. Okay. So do you see my screen fine? Yes. Okay. So as I said, I just compiled a bunch of stories for you. And um, they are all, they all come from my um, doctoral research uh, for which the funding was late. So instead of writing one of those sustainability proposals um, as that's what gets you money, I just started writing about our village 
uh, about which nobody really cared. Like nobody really understood why am I writing about a village in the middle of the desert in Egypt? Why am I not even comparing it to a European context so that I can get funding? So, um, but it was very important to me as this was a, a personal question on um, who I am and uh, what does it mean to be a diasporic self uh, in this world? And what does it mean to find your um, African epistemic grounding? And I feel like this story might uh, resonate with some of you and might really um, find as its ties to what happened in um, in Africa town or what happened especially, especially in Africa town and this idea of how people, despite every single um, piece of injustice and dehumanization, especially how Africa and its children are able to carve a space within the cracks of the system and how Africa can reproduce itself wherever it is or African epistemologies can reproduce themselves um, within the cracks of really hegemonic systems. So my research had some main questions. So a question is why would a marginal build? Why don't we just occupy other people's buildings? Why would, would we build in the first place? Why would we not sit there and wait for people to build for us? As is the case, I'm gonna tell you later. And how can I then represent myself as an architect within this practice and, and find an imaginary outside the Eurocentric one in which our design field lies? And also how do I, like my grandmother, practice space making and architecture emotionally? But above all, for me personally, how to be displaced from where I have never been. I was born in the 80s. The displacement happened in the 60s. I have been carrying, not just me, all Nubian generations carry that pain of displacement. And it's not going to go away. It's going to go to my child and the next generation until we get our land back. But also, the question for me is not just how it happened, it's how to go about it. How do I spatially go about the fact that I am displaced from where I have never been? How do I then be that agent of uh, er er erupting spaces, of the erupting space within the cracks of the system? How do I then become the agent of the un, um, f f uh, against that erasure, that spatial erasure that happened? Let me tell you what happened. Well, Nubians, Nubians um, have lived in the area that is now between Egypt and Sudan. So when you hear about ancient Egypt and the pharaohs, they lived between, if you see my cursor, they lived between this area all the way until this area. And then between this point and all the way until the sixth cataract of the Nile, it was the Nubian kingdom. But of course, the a British colonizer came into the area in the 18th century, decided that this, this land is one land, this land is not going to work this way. We're just going to put a line between them and have Egypt be uh, Egypt be this territory until this, which is the latitude 2022. Um, and this would be uh, Sudan. Then Nubian land became uh, that's, this was one of the first structures in, in the land because a cousin became in Egypt and a cousin became Sudanese. And this is actually a very big issue within the Nubian community because it's a, the borders don't make sense because we don't speak the language, we speak our indigenous language altogether. We don't speak the language of people north to us or south to us. The, our music is common to this area and we actually are literally first cousins. So my first and second cousins hold Sudanese passports while I hold an Egyptian passport. So all these kind of constructed nation states that required uh, a certain kind of citizenship, a forced citizenship on indigenous, indigenous groups within Africa forced by colonial, um, uh, by colonial rule has really created ruptures in, in ancient territories in the area. The Nubian, Nubia was a, a, a land of the Nile. So people would build looking at the Nile. Nubia is nothing without its Nile. We are 
historically the harp, harp worshiper of the Nile and the relationship with water permeates into every single aspect of our life, which has been really destroyed by displacement. But the, this, is, this is my old village. So in the 60s, my grandfather owned this basin, this basin here. And I don't know which one, but one of these houses was my great grandmother's house. This took me so, so much work to find. And now what happened is that the state has displaced Nubians all, all over the 20th century uh, for the sake of dams. So in 1902, the state built what is called the Aswan Low Dam. So damming is at this point, the low dam and the high dam. It, this is going to get a bit technical. So um, Nubians lived, lived by the banks of the river. What happened, and this, this entire area was, a, of, was agricultural. What happened with the first uh, damming is that it, uh, it really submerged uh, all this area and some uh, houses. And they built the dam and the water level risen, had risen and they did not tell people. That means water went into people's houses at night and flooded them to death. So we hear horror stories about how water that they have worshipped for years came into the night that's very early in the very early 20th century and just flood people to death. In 1912, they did the same thing again because of why would they care about those black people in the south of Egypt? The, it's, uh, th then there was the decision, um, the decision, decision of the um, uh, British colonizers, the Nubian territory for them was just a, a source of enslaved people before enslavement was uh, illegal in the 18th century. And now they, uh, it's just a, a non-worthy space for them. Then, then in the 1933, they decided to heighten the dam a third time. And what happened then, it was really devastating on a lot of the built environment. And then in the 60s, and this was the biggest devastation. It was done, however, in a systemic way through the post-colonial state of Egypt under Abdel Nasser, and it submerged every single piece of Nubian land within the Egyptian border and uh, 26 train stations in the Sudanese border who were displaced way to the south. And we were displaced way to the north. This is the low dam. This is the, sm the smaller dam. Then it was uh, it was built by uh, English engineers. They, it was celebrated and nobody cared to, call, to tell Nubians, well, water level is going to get higher, people uh, pay attention. But what happened after the 1933 is that Nubians went to higher ground and rebuilt their villages. And uh, Egyptian architect Hassan Fathi talks about how people rebuilt entire villages in 12 months, while the state then, which was the English uh, colonizer then, refused to pay any um, reparations. And people have built their entire villages in 12 months, 30,000 houses. These are, these, this is the part of the Nubian land that had got submerged in the 20, 1933. So, so even when you get drowned to death, you reproduce yourself you reproduce your territory again. And then, and then also uh, Hassan Fathi, who is an Egyptian architect, and when I say Egyptian, I mean somebody from the North. Um, uh, it's a very iffy thing when it comes to uh, identities, because when I don't call myself Egyptian, some people get really uh, annoyed. Uh, so it, this, this um, architect said how, how marvelous it was to see 30,000 houses, none of which looks like the other. How can you build all this in the short, short amount of time with the uniqueness of every single house? Fast forward 50, 80 years from that, these villages became, these villages became submerged except for three. Three villages, um, um, how do I say, survived by the Nile, while everybody else got sent into the in the 60s, uh, got sent into displacement, uh, um, a displacement villages that we are going to talk about later. And these three villages were the only three Nubian villages that got to stay next to the Nile. But because they are, um, because they are, have no economic backbone, what happened is that 
uh, investors from Cairo and architects from Cairo decided that they want to build uh, um, a touristic space in there. And they decided that they're going, if they leave the houses as is, these lovely white houses, it's not going to attract uh, tourists. So they need to meet what Egyptians think of Nubians. So Nubians now have to re so people from outside this area, people outside from, from outside this indigenous field of knowledge now get to decide what Nubian architecture looks like. And if you don't comply with their image of your architecture of yourself, you're not going to make any money. So what happened is that people all tried to meet that uh, imaginary, which is basically a fantasy of people from urban area about who Nubians are. The happy black people who wear colorful clothes and the, they are dancing all the time, which is basically the, the uh, kind of stereotypical uh, tourism uh, fantasies of people, of people who perform whiteness over um, African spaces in the field of tourism. And I wanted, and the, these these photos are from 2006. So I did this in my field research in 2006. And from in, in this short amount of time, the entire village that was white, it was pearl white because of the sun. It was in the, we, we come from a very heated area on earth. We, we It's hot, it's really hot. So white is very important. So um, for, for environmental control, uh, but now this doesn't make any money. So people had to go in and, and use all these um, paints that are not also from the environment, just, just industrial paints to, to try to meet that imaginary. Let's, let me take you to the next historical point, um, the high dam. And I opted to put this image here to talk about why the high dam was this kind of disastrous thing. Uh, in 1964, Abdel Nasser was trying to build a new Egypt. He wanted a new pyramid. He wanted a new national project. His, he was also notoriously known for his uh, anti-racist uh, stance. And he was also uh, known for how uh, friendly he is to the African continent. However, the systems that have ran this operation, starting from building the dam all the way to the displacement of Nubians, was highly racist. It was the system that is already embedded within, within the Egyptian social fabric. It was a system that was already embedded by the colonial uh, regime. As Timothy Mitchell says, how, that, um, how post-colonial states did not really abandon colonial systems. They just re-perpetuated them and, and relabeled them. Uh, so the, the high dam, has caused the displacement of my people. So I, my, me, my, my family was displaced by the high dam in 1964. And it was one of the most devastating things that can happen to somebody being cut from your land and being cut from your um, ancestral uh, uh, soil for just like that. And the biggest issue actually, and this might be very interesting for you as uh, when you think about um, what happened and people coming in the ship and death is that the, the issue was that people were going to be displaced away from their burial grounds. So you cannot take the, the remains, remains of people who, uh, your people who were dead. And that's a death sentence because death, the death within an African episteme does not really happen with the um, expiration of your body. You actually can extend the social life of somebody through visiting them and through, through regenerating them, through keeping the, their story open, to also through keeping their house open. How the house becomes this extension of a body, the extension of the person's flesh. So there are so many spatial mechanism, mechanisms that had to do with keeping people alive. And ha having all these spatial mechanisms uh, drowned means this is a death, death sentence to everybody who is buried in that area. So this was one of the biggest issues to leave the dead, to leave the people who are buried. And people were packed into um, buses, they were backed into ships, and then they were backed into buses, and then they were backed into other ships and other buses, and it was a very long, and ruling process. Did somebody say something? 
No. Okay. Okay. So we fast forward to now we have a whole population displaced into this area. So the people who lived under all this line of water are now in, concentrated in this area, which is basically a big uh, planned prison as it's a, a water canal all around it. And there are three entrances and all three entrances are um, backed with uh, soldiers. So nobody can come in and out if they feel like they are suspicious. I can't really take a journalist in. Like I can, can't take some white people into the space and uh, soldiers would let us really uh, go. And then they promise Nubians they are going to go live in, in this new paradise and they're going to have they are going to own land. Uh, it's uh, the, their struggles are over. They're going to go into prosperity and modernity. And of course, that was not true. My grandmother tells me that they backed us into ships like animals with our animals. And then they decided that animals are uh, must be quarantined and then they never gave them back to us. So that's wealth being lost. And they went from their uh, land by the river and palm trees into this uh, state built project in the middle of the desert. And here is, here comes the, here starts the 50 years of grueling spatial resistance, how it's the built environment in people are in contestation and in war or in fights uh, over and over every day uh, from the day of displacement till now. People went into their um, their space of dis places of displacement. The city said the state said they built seventeen thousand houses. Remember, in the thirties, people rebuilt thirty three thousand houses, and this was just a partial displacement. Now, seventeen thousand houses was not re nearly enough. People went in without uh, went there, and the state agents told told them, uh, "Here is a chalk line on the ground. That's going to be your house." So basically people in the middle of the desert and most of them were in the summer. That's that's dangerously hot to, to have no roof over your head. Plus none of the houses were roofed. None of the houses had, had doors. So it was pretty much uh, just uh, shells and people had to rebuild uh, their entire space. It, space anyway, it's like Nubia, this place. The thing is that the state called this new Nubia and we never call it new Nubia. We call it Tehgir, which means a place of displacement. So you would stop a car or a taxi or a microbus and ask them if they're going to the place of displacement. No, nobody is, except for the state uses the term new Nubia. I think they also abandoned it. They're using something else now, but this, this was the hope that this would be new Nubia, but Nubians really rejected it. This is a house that the state offered, the, the gray one. This is how they got it. And people had to do all kinds of modifications on it, especially this bench right here. The house, the Nubian house was uh, 500 to 1,000 meters square in surface area. I don't know what is that in Imperial, so you're going to have to do some math. It was a huge surface area as it was not a place of shelter. It was a place of the political and the social um, and, and the making of oneself. It's, it was a point of origin. And it was ran by the a matriarchal system of Nubian elderly women. But then in displacement, the houses were around uh, 100 meters square, which is one tenth of what the Nubian house was before displacement or less than one tenth. This actually is one of the, these terms of resistance. So some Nubians went into these villages and said, we don't want your houses and went all the way outside the outskirts of the village and started building houses as they were before uh, this placement. This one is built by my great grandmother for her uh, son, my great uncle. And this huge house is occupied by three people. This is the role of a Nubian house, to stand like a small city ready for 150 people to occupy it for uh, uh, events of rites of passage or uh, events of, uh, of social importance. And all these uh, buildings 
has not stopped since 1960s to this day. This is a render from memory of my grandmother. So uh, I do use renders to um, kind of uh, get things out of memory and, uh, and, and see what used to happen spatially in our house. And we had this Juafa tree in the middle of our house that used to um, die because of, uh, or used to be always sick because of the, the bad soil in the displacement villages. And they used to try to take care of it as if it's one of the, it's, it, is, it is as if it's the house pet, although we had a cat as well that uh, lived in the house, but, um, it was also one part of the part of the family members, and I um, remember how my grandmother was there taking care of that house that was cracking every ten years because of that bad soil, and trying to maintain the house as the core of our being, as the point of origin. As you see, you see the cracks back there. This is our traditional garb, the good God for all Nubian women. And you see the cracks there? Every seven years, every house within these villages will crack completely and people will have to rebuild it. So it's like an Olympus thing. You are just building, you are just building and it cracks and you build and it cracks. And here is my favorite piece of architecture ever. This bench. It's called the Mastaba and that's an Arabic word. And uh, in my assessment, the use of the Arabic word was to make it less um, um, less intimidating to the state agents who saw all these um, benches being built in front of houses. Uh, the, the state built um, the the smaller, like the, the inner frame of the house, and people started adding these things. And the mustabas, after three years of displacement, uh, was all over all the displacement. It was a spear, an effort spearheaded by women. This element is our first interaction with the outside world, but it's also the a, a term of refusal of the domestic space and the private space. The Nubian house is neither domestic nor private. The domestic, the domesticity that starts at the fact that you uh, come as a wild being or a biological non-social and then become domesticated and then go to the public space for the social, to be a social is not compatible with African epistemologies. And the fact that there is an, an, uh, an, a private space and a public space and the private space is for women and the public space is for men and this kind of duality and segregation is also ontologically inapplicable within African epistemes. So what happens is that this um, uh, bench becomes um, a line of suspension to these dualities against this kind of architecture that, that imposes different epistemologies and imposes different uh, uh, different ways of life that um, and erases what a Nubian house is, a Nubian house as the point of origin. The African house in general is a point of origin. The story, the myth of origin, it's not the place of domestication, it is the place of be becoming. Uh, so the, and also it just brings the house outside and the brings inside uh, in. Let me show you some cool things it does. So there were no windows when the state offered these houses and people started off opening windows to uh, the Mostaba. And this, what we just, we never used the door when we were young. We would just step in and out. And there is a bench on the other side of this. So like, like as you see here in the lower image, and you just jump in and out. And this kind of um, blurred line between the inside and the outside. This is how it looks like in our village. Every single house that is occupied has these kinds of uh, uh, elements in it, like just a comp that takes the the, the street and 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 give it gives it to the house. And uh, these are so many things that the mostaba allows you to do. If there is a mostaba, you can choose to not sit on it and sit on the ground in front of it because it act, it basically claims ownership over the ground next to it. And the funny thing is that usually um, these these seatings when Nubian older elderly Nubian women are um, are streets where um, agriculture should pass. So this is where agriculture should um, 
this is where agriculture should uh, some uh, uh, so should like the trucks with with all these crops should pass to go to uh, uh, kind of um, uh, go to the markets the bigger markets and so but no driver would dare drive and create dust next to elderly Nubian women so they have to drive all the way around the village and not interrupt these streets. So they, the, the street itself and its land use that was designated within the plan has been changed completely. It became a living street because of these kinds of elements. And we often had the beds out in the summer and slept in the street, just taking this, the, 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 the space out and, and refusing this line between private and public, this duality that is born out of, um, uh, the, uh, out of um, doctrine, doctrines of, of uh, property, this idea of this is yours, that is a private, and that is for the public, which is never really for everybody. Uh, this is also in front of my other grandmother's house. Somebody's asking something? No, keep going. Okay. I'll, I'm monitoring this. No, not really. This is this was not for selling anything because here is the thing: you don't own this mastaba. It's not you. It, it it's attached to your house, but it's not yours. So you can't really ask people to leave it because it it just blurs this ownership. You build it. You attach it to your house. It basically overlooks the inside of your house, but it's not yours, and anybody can sit on it. But it also makes it that the space in front of it is yours to sit. And as you see, I don't uh, have any real people in here because the use of the camera is very violent within these contexts. Anthropologists and scientists have been shooting and taking pictures of people in an extractionist way that the camera had this effect as like a gun. It's like you're pointing something in front of people's um, faces. And I have a bunch of um, photos of people that my husband had taken he's not nubian uh, and i was mortified i was thinking we're going to get i'm going to get disowned what are you doing we don't take pictures of people and um i then had to recreate everything through collaging them this is uh, my grandmother's street all these women live in these houses they come every day in the morning they sit here they have lunch cars cannot go by so the time their time there is cars cannot go by. Cars have to go all the way around uh, the, the area and take the longer route because Nubian women now took this, this street. And this is another kind of uh, very interesting resistance. So because the Nubian houses were reduced into these small dwelling units, people lost this big space of the social and the political. So what they did is that they built a quasi house. It looks like a house. Any state agent, if they, um, if any state agent comes in, it looks like a house. This is this is um, this is what I'm talking about. And it's basically a house without the rooms, and it becomes like a public, or not public. It becomes like. Um, uh, a space, uh, a, um, a proxy for the house. So if you have a wedding, you take the key for that space. It's furnished with, with all the things that you need for a house. There is a funding, uh, there's a financing system uh, that works. This is just emotional capital, uh, kind of running and operating a space. And then if you have the, uh, uh, the, the event, you take the key and you start um, using the space. Of course, it got um, the walls were cracked. The community doesn't have enough money to kind of rebuild it. Uh, but this has been the center of our social life for those who don't who have smaller houses, not big. No, they don't have a big house anymore like they did before. And this acts like a proxy house. And if there is there are no events, it sits silently. It does nothing. It's just closed as if there is as if it's dead. And it's it's hidden. It's, it's hidden and you, you, I never thought that the state agents thought it's a house. So it was two state agents registered as somebody's house uh, because they did not want them to know that there is a, 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 now a centralized space for um, gathering as that would really freak them out. And this, uh, and at night, if there is a wedding, it would become uh, crowded with people, we used to dance here all the time, barefoot, good days. And 
It would be a big dining area if it's uh, Ramadan, uh, where people want to come together. It's it just acted as if it's a proxy of the old Nubian house that people did not have anymore. Some people were lucky enough to rebuild bigger houses, but most of the people did not have the funds and had to settle for the smaller state-built houses and needed this kind of proxy to act as the Nubian house when they needed one. And it was built by women, by the way. We, we had three in our village and one of which was built by, by my grandmother. And when they say somebody built a house, doesn't that mean that they built it with their hands? That means that they, they uh, sorry, they, uh, how do I say it? invested emotional capital in it, uh, operated um, uh, funding, um, the funding through trust, um, decided on the, the orientations and the, the shapes and the spaces while sitting and, and feeding people and taking care of people uh, who are building it with their hands. So if you look at this, then what does it make, what does, how does that inform the identity of the architect? Then who is the architect then? So can the architect be that emotional labor? Well, within this episteme, I, I say it, it was. There is an empirical evidence that, that um, uh, an emotional labor becomes credited with the building process. See this, the red ones, this one, this one, and this one. These were the hidden houses. Uh, it's called Madhyafa, but to everybody else that is not Nubian, that is from not from this area, it's hidden as the as if it's just a house. Other ways of resistance was really against this uh, uh, rectangulinear um, planning. So people started adding trees outside their houses, even though there is no um, sewage systems and they have to um, uh, they have these septic tanks underneath this land and this, these trees are really struggling. Uh, but uh, they really, okay, uh, uh, they really did um, try to disrupt the street by creating shade, by creating these green spaces. And another one that I really love is that the key and the, the, the um, uh, how do I say it, the, the lock of a house uh, is, is, does not make any sense within African epistemologies because there is no property to, to pr pr protect. So a lock is something you use to tell people that you're not in, in your house. It was something big like this one. But the new houses then had these doors, which were installed like two years later, uh, and they had um, these uh, uh, tradition, like just the locks, the, the very simple locks that lock from the inside, which makes doesn't make any sense for Nubians because you would like to open the house from the outside. Why would you lock your house? So they just had this hole in the door. And if you're coming from the outside, don't need to knock. Anybody can go into any Nubian house. Just pull this string and go inside the house just to disrupt this idea of the lock in the first place. And every house then created one room as an in-house museum. But basically nobody, this is something that really is hidden from even researchers of Nubian architecture, that there is an in-house museum that somehow maintains the lives of people. As I said, when we were talking about death, it's, there are so many ways to avoid social death. There are so many ways to avoid, to, to, for you to live beyond your bodily existence. And there was these, this is my grand, great grandmother's um, chest with all her stuff inside and with, with her uh, prayer rugs next to it. And nobody gets to use them. This, this is now just a shrine to her and to her stories. So the Nubian village post-displacement is in a fight every day with houses, with modernist houses that are designed for the biological, um, private domestic sphere that, do, that are not really compatible with, with a Nubian episteme. The, they are, in, they are um, in challenge with spaces that are forced as being public while they don't really meet what Nubians need in their uh, social life. And they, there are also the other institutions of op oppression like schools and um, and medical centers that now start tre treating Nubians as um, the sub new subject of the state that, th that need to be 
made into the citizen that Egypt needs, not the other way around. So for example, Nubians are forced to sing in school the praise of the high dam that drowned all their land. And the, the nice thing is that spaces also can hide in language because within the Nubian language, there are songs that we sing in every wedding, dancing to it. And within the song, we just say, we wish the dam would break, which is something that would take, give you, take you to jail in Egypt. If you would say something like this, it's a threat uh, to public infrastructures and it you would be taken to jail uh, for uh, treason. Uh, so within the Nubian language, all these spaces and all these imaginaries then get to, get to live. That's it. I just wanted to show you uh, some spatial interventions on so what happened and the fact that it doesn't matter the marginal will build for itself against erasure. Uh, the way uh, we understand the space is the way we understand the world, through which we understand the world and imposing a space um, and imposing an episteme on another one uh, in a, a trial to make them assimilate to a larger nationalist project is a, a huge um, effort towards epistemic violence. And uh, us as the architects from these kinds of uh, paradigms that are subject to erasure and our allies should be very aware of our epistemic standing. Where do we stand? What does it mean to build? What does space mean? What To me, for example, I, I really struggle when people start speaking about space and place because there are three ways to ask where in Nubian. It's a space that is never geographic is Hi, do you, did I do something? Okay. No, 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 okay. Just keep going. A space that is never geographic, is uh, that is not geographic or not material, exists within this epistemology. A space that is inside the Nile, a completely imaginative space inside the Nile with its pe parallel people and parallel lives and parallel powers also exists within this epistemology. And all these things become, become ways in with which we understand life and we understand reality. And it also becomes policy with which we treat uh, the environmental elements around us. So I was just, trying to answer that question uh, that I said in the beginning about how to be displaced from where you have never been and trying to answer the aspect of how, how do we go about it. And I was trying to, I wrote some notes and maybe these notes would be helpful for you going forward. So I wrote design for disruption for a system that has already disrupted you. Design for the social, as Rachel Mbembe said, we are now, um, we are now at risk of losing the social altogether. The social is at risk of being obsolete and design away from the white gaze, design for invisibility. Invisibility is needed if you, if, if you are within disenfranchised groups and design for prosperity, it's designed for, for, for people to live better and, and have material resources, but also design for the retrieval of meaning. It's this position of being where you don't belong, but also not really having the, the privilege of attaching yourself for, to where you belong makes it imperative that we create and, and produce and validate our own fields of meaning. And that's it. Maybe we can discuss if there's time. I know I went on and on and on. I just piled everything in. <laughs> No, that was great. I appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. I mean, uh, lots of those issues that you were talking about are really front and center in our studio. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that there will be some queries, especially from my studio, but from students in general. Um, if not, I certainly have a couple of points to, to, uh, to lay out on the table as well. Um, so, I will first turn it over to uh, our students and, 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 and uh, uh, Wallenberg faculty as well, if you have any uh, comments, questions, um, anything you would like to add. Um, so I would also appreciate it if you all who are able to turn your, uh, your screens on again. So it looks like we're having a conversation. That would be fantastic. 
Yeah, don't be embarrassed. My daughter is going to come in and create a fuss in five minutes. So it's it's okay if things are, and I'm sure her hair is messy and she looks messy. And so don't worry. Well, half <laughs> of the people you're looking at don't have pants on right now. So it's fine. <laughs> so floor is open, anyone? I guess I have a question. Um, you mentioned about buildings that crack every seven to 10 years, right? And you said that they need to be rebuilt. It seemed like in the image that you showed us that the cracks were kind of patched and filled in. Is it like kind of like a, I mean, like, are they brought back to life or do you really have to start over, move over and rebuild the building completely? Yes, that's pretty much what happens. The it's a it, you build wall by wall because people will will not afford to just take down the entire space and rebuild it completely. And um, and this is also something that not just in 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 Nubian villages because because this was a, a big planning mistake. They just ha did not care to see the quality of the soil for a future of uh, built environment. They just they just wanted to build that pyramid of theirs and just let the, those Nubians go and and be dis disappear. This is basically the, the issue. And the so the, what happens is that um, once you build the soil gets gets in humidity and start holding like pinching your um, your foundations and then mm -hmm. a small a small crack would open and you then you repair it and then it gets bigger and you repair it and it gets bigger and you repair it and it and the crack starts the next year of repair so when you remove the entire wall when you when you, you when you fix the entire wall the next year the crack will start again and it's um a note uh, also, Ashley Mbembe, this for the second time quoting him, uh, talks about Africa, how that reparations, repairing is against the linearity even of Western, uh, of Western perception of time, is something that permeates everyday life in Africa. Every day we are repairing something that was messed up by the systems, the colonial and the, the, the colonial and the post-colonial that has performed colonial rules on, on this continent, that every day we are repairing something. And this is the case with these walls. It's basically just a, an Olympus pushing a stone kind of thing. You're just, it mm. cracks and, and you repair it the next year. And it's a lot of financial burden. I guess my other question would be then, is there any way that you could use kind of different building practices that are kind of more adapted to this kind of different landscape that's not necessarily the landscape that these buildings were developed for to kind you're, of you're not allowed because you don't own the houses the state owns the houses the houses the state does not allow you to use any materials on sanction they have they wrote a law and the material of the house is part of the law okay, cool thank you <laughs> cool yeah that's a <laughs> well not cool right yeah, i know i am joking i know yeah, yeah of course <laughs> Um, I have a question. Yes. So you you mentioned you talked about how um, sort of the outsiders brought in the paint to paint the houses and bring tourism in. Um, and I was wondering if there was any way that the Nubians resisted the tourism culture. Um, yeah. In the beginning, yes. In the beginning, they did not like it, and they were very aggressive to where Nubians are known for being good natured people. It's a Nile culture. And if you are by the Nile, it's just calm. It's just like, it's serene. So they were aggressive in the beginning, but then they discovered that there is no way to make money in this area, but to accept tourism. There's absolutely no, you will go, uh, you will starve if you don't accept this. And there are no, this is the only way you can have funds to build schools. This is the only way to have funds to build infrastructure because also those people don't own their land and don't own their houses. We are basically refugees within the same, within the same state. Thank you. Um, I guess I was just wondering if you see any, oh. Yeah, if you see any way like forward or any way to change this kind of cycle, I mean, obviously it's like a governmental thing, but I was just wondering if there, through your research, if you see any potentials to help. Return, the right to return and get our actual land in its vast 
um, surface back by the Nile and get to develop it and get, get to build Nubian wealth again. This is, this is a forced displacement. Uh, it was built there, it was made with a, the with a intention of uh, assimilating Nubians and having them kind of dissolve within the Egyptian government, Egyptian society to forget their uh, traditions and language and forget their identity and become Egyptians. So because it was, there was a lot of anxieties, there was a, something called the Arab Nationalist Project. They wanted all of us to be Arabs, but we are Africans. Um, as Egypt, with it, even though it was an Arab country, uh, sorry, an, an African country, it belonged to this Pan-African project while Nubians who speak a Nilo Saharan language uh, and practice all these quintessentially African traditions or epistemologies um, did not fit into the, that larger scape. But, but we are not just speaking about it. We have been trying to return for years. There are three or four um, trials to return that has been retaliated to on by the state. And the last one was my family was involved in it in 2012 after the revolution. Uh, we could add a, um, an amendment to the Egyptian constitution to assure Nubian return again. So people started to go buy their land back and start farming. Then the state decided that this whole area is a national security area and people are not allowed. And they kicked everybody after we got all this land again. So it's, there is always this, we try to go and they kick us away and we try to go and we, we're not going to stop go, trying to go. And I hope they stop trying to kick us away. Okay. I have a question about um, the tourism. How would you build for tourism, but also center it away from the white days? You don't, you build for the story, not for the exhibition. So the thing is, why would you want to go and see that place? Why, why is it, what does it, because it's about, so if it's about the exhibition, it's about something that it fulfills in you. For the Egyptian tourist in the north, the upper middle class Egyptian tourist, for them, it fulfills an idea that there is this serene area by the Nile with these very docile and lovely people who are dancing all the time, happiness, 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 not, not remembering that this is a displaced population, just happiness. And they can go there and relax and just clean their souls. And then when they come there, for me to get that money off, off from, from tourism, I have to meet their imaginary of me. I have to be that person they want me to be. So if, if it's about that exhibition, and it's about that imaginary of the other, the othering imaginary, it becomes very, it becomes epistemic and cultural violence. But then if it's about the story, so it's about the city making sense of itself or the place making sense of itself and, and writing its own story. And then this story resonates with people who want to come and, and, and be part of it, or at least come and um, bask in its air in the era of the story. The story is so important within African epistemologies. The story is dangerous. The story is how realities are made away, from, away of hegemonic systems. So making that story or fortifying that story is more important. And then the, um, the, the foot track comes for the story, not to meet their story or the, their imaginary. Does it make sense? Do I make sense a bit? Do you think that tourists would be attracted to coming to visit things as a story? I guess like this isn't necessarily like for Nubia in general, but like in general, you think tourists would be able to like kind of find interest in those kind of things in like honest stories without like a grand social change kind yes. of and, like a, yeah. Have you heard of pilgrimage? Right. Yeah. But, I mean, I think that's like a bit more different. I think pilgrimage is a bit more of a personal kind of tourism, right? as opposed to, um, I guess, kind of like explorative or cultural tourism? Like, do you think that people would still go there without the kind of Disneyland effect that people are kind of used to in tourism? Yes, but here's the thing. 
if you put me in because this is where this is my conundrum this is this is my conundrum in in my villages people are not going to come to me without the colors and the clownish shenanigans so what do i do because I was the issue to begin with that is the fact that I was pushed against the wall and have no economic alternative to meeting that imaginary. So how can I remain, um, maintain the integrity of my own story? And it's not about making it, com making it compelling, but making it true and sincere and, and uh, loud. And then this would be the, the, where where people would want to go because within the I think within your context there is so much connection and I would think I would think we would we go to the the last village before the displaced land so we would go and stare at a body of water underneath which our old land is submerged and cry that's it. We just, it's it it I and I have never seen it. I was born in displacement villages, but the fact that I stand over water and under this water, my ancestors in my my history on my original land, I'm and my right to a territory taken away is is a very powerful story that brings me into just desert. It's just desert and a body of water. So the story itself and the conviction in it is so important. And this being. Um, the last community, and I was reading and how there's still language, uh, Uruba language, or uh, I think the, the com most of the communities were brought from Benin in in um, uh, yeah. Africa town from Benin. So there are still language there. That means there are still spaces that are hidden in that language. If I, if I was there, I would want to go. I would want to go and 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 see that have that connection, have that last limb that is closest to a mother that I never had. So there are so many stories to um, um, to validate. And these stories would, would have um, people who want it and want to see it. But to me, if you tell me, well, otherwise, it's either we, we build the, the clownish, how do I say it? Disneyland. The clown, the the Disneyland. If we do the Disneyland, if, there, if you tell me you have no choice but to do the Disneyland, what I will tell you, well, you put me against the wall and you are now causing erasure. And now I have to erase my own history with my hand. It's like, I'm, I'm going to have to dig my cultural grave with my hand because I have no, nowhere else to go and I need to eat. So we really, as architects, need to know how to thread that needle very carefully. Thank you. So we're coming up to, uh, we have about four minutes left um, in our planned, uh, planned talk. So if there are any final questions anyone has, we should probably get them in now. Um, if not, I've got at least one that I'd like to, to throw out there, but I, I'm much more interested. I can talk, I can talk to, <laughs> I can talk to Mina offline, but you, um, you, you have, you know, this moment to uh, for yourself. So um, please, if there is something that's hanging on your mind, uh, please share. Can I tell you one last thing? Can sure. I tell you one last thing? Mm -hmm. um, as I was telling you, Craig, I was uh, doing research on the mastaba, the, the the bench that kind of suspends the inside and the outside, and I discovered that the 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 uh, porch in American architecture in the South was brought by enslaved African people. So Africa has produced again, even on American on the on Turtle Island, so to give native people their land back, uh, uh, it has reproduced itself and tried to uh, blur the line between the inside and the outside and bring the house in outside and bring the street inside. Just wanted to remind. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you literally can't find a home in Africa town that does not have a porch on it. It's, you just, you can't, you can't find one. Um, that just doesn't, they don't, they don't exist except for like you mentioned, state-built homes, like the uh, housing projects that were in built there by the state, um, but the ones where 
people have either built for themselves or help build with other people, they all have a porch. They all have a porch. Um, this, there's one point I wanted to maybe bring up, maybe have you uh, talk about a little bit before we leave. Um, actually, two. One, um, you, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, it is in, in a sense, in this process of building that you get to know yourself, you get to say, you name yourself, you know, you get to, you know, in a sense, uh, encapsulate your values and your, um, uh, uh, your, your ancestors and your spirits. Um, would you, could, could it be possible to sort of see this constant, um, you know, maintenance on these buildings as this process of continually rebuilding yourself or continually making yourself or making your, your community? Um, I see it as, in a sense, as a burden, yes, because you always have to do it. But the flip side of that is, you know, you are, if, if the process of building is so important, that this is a way to sort of continually maybe, um, maybe not even reimagine yourself, but to revalidate yourself in a sense? Yes, because my grandmother always has the option to move to Cairo. And there are always people in, in displacement villages always have uh, um, relatives in diaspora. They could save this money and go live with their this, these relatives and leave these villages altogether. But it's so important that this, this crack is mended. It's this, this fracture and this rupture is mended. And it's the, and I, I once asked my grandmother, are you going to do this forever? And she said, well, well, I am going to die one day. So she's going to rebuild her walls until she, her, the, the day of her death. And then she said, then it's your role. It's your, it's your t turn. You build it or not. Of course, she's guilting us to continue <laughs> fixing the house. It's like an African grandmother strategies all around, always guilting you into doing things. Like when I die, it soon becomes your, your, your turn. I don't know if you're going to build it or not because this house is an extension of her flesh. If she dies, this house needs to be open for her to stay alive. So it's, so it's not, they're not just mending walls. They are mending a third skin. Mm -hmm. And the last point I wanted to make was this idea about, you know, designing for invisibility. That's, that's a really intriguing uh, statement. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if you would like to say a little bit more about that. If not, no worries. I, I'm certainly going to bring it up with, with my students. Um, you know, we, that's not something typically that we as designers do, right? We want our work to be seen. Um, we, want, um, we want it to be public, you know? And so this idea of designing for invisibility um, is, is intriguing. I mean, how do you, I understand the reason why you're doing that is it's sort of, uh, it's kind of like protection. Uh, but the flip side of that is, uh, you know, that's not normally how designers think. But then designers have other oh, conventional practice or how we were trained into architecture has us in an exhibitionist complex, complex all the time. We need to exhibit. But if we stop designing for the exhibition and start designing for the story, I, as I was saying, and trying to protect the story, it becomes a tra a strategies like designing for veiling or designing for invisibility become really important. And designing for mendacity and designing for trickery and designing for hacking, all these things that are, are seen as beneath us as architects, they don't go into our portfolio, are so important in protecting and uh, allowing for cracks in the system. It's not it, because our role is not just to build within the cracks of the system, but to also create cracks within the system for future um, for future possibilities of, of erupting um, pieces of space, spatial productions within these indigenous ecosystems. Because if they they don't have any other space within the state uh, um, landscape, they don't have a space there. So for me. 
And how do I become displaced from where I have, how do I go about being displaced from where I have never been is to adopt these techniques and these kind of tactics and strategies on how to um, find, not just build within the cracks of the system, but also create the cracks within the system to build. Thank you. I think that's a perfect, perfect line uh, with which to end this conversation, which has been wonderful. Thank you very much, Mina, for uh, being here. Um, I hope everyone, and I'm sure, I hope uh, everyone enjoyed uh, hearing this uh, rather personal story. And I just want to thank you for sharing it. I mean, it's not, I know it can't be easy. Um, and so we really appreciate your uh, opening up and talking to us about this in a, in a, in a real way, not in necessarily in an abstract way. So. I, I was very happy being here and thank you for, I was, it, if it was a bit hectic, sorry for that. I got too excited, just piled everything there. And here's my grandmother's house and here's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, family would do that to you. <laughs> yes, they do. They do. When they guilt you, yes. Uh, okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate it. I hope everyone uh, will uh, join me in saying, you know, uh, appreciate the time and uh, I will be talking with you later. All right. Okay. Ciao. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Mina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.